Try Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. You can get two months free by using promo code CHAT at therapynotes.com. Trauma Therapist Network is a website to learn about trauma and how it shows up in our lives and to find a trauma therapist. Go to traumatherapistnetwork.com to find a trauma therapist near you today. Therapy Chat Podcast, Episode 402. This is the Therapy Chat Podcast with Laura Reagan, LCSWC. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. And now, here's your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so excited to be bringing you a conversation with my friend and colleague in our local area, Lauren Going. Lauren Going, LCSWC, is a yoga instructor and therapist. She's the co-founder of Inner Path Wellness in Baltimore. Lauren is committed to supporting healing on both an individual and collective level. She brings a unique set of skills to help catalyze shifts in clients, systems, and organizations. She specializes in trauma and is committed to deep growth and transformation. Lauren wears many hats, a co-founder of Inner Path Wellness, a holistic psychotherapist who specializes in ketamine-assisted therapy, a meditation and yoga instructor, dynamic speaker, dance and movement facilitator, and a consultant for organizations and conscious businesses. She believes healing is only possible when we experience unconditional acceptance and true belonging. And I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. I wanted to ask Lauren everything I could think of about having a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy practice and how she does things and what happens there and she just answered. No matter what I asked, she had a clear, straightforward answer that was very helpful. She talked about the research on psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. She talked about what happens in a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy session, at least in the way that she practices in her in her work. And she gave some do's and don'ts about finding a psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy practitioner to work with and for clinicians and talked about some of the trainings that are available and much more. So I hope you will enjoy this conversation. I found it very enlightening and interesting and enjoyable. So I hope you will too. As always, I'd love to hear your feedback. I'd love to connect with you on social media. You can find me on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at Therapy Chat Pod. I do not have any other TikTok in my name besides at Therapy Chat Pod. There is someone else who created one using some of my pictures and videos pretending to be me. That's not me. The only TikTok that I am part of is at Therapy Chat Pod. And that's the same handle on Facebook and Instagram as well. If you like therapy chat. I would love for you to go to Apple Podcasts and like and subscribe, leave a rating and review. Also follow on Spotify if that's where you prefer to listen. This helps people find the podcast. And I'm so grateful to all of you who listen, whether this is your first time or if you've been here for all 402 plus episodes, I'm glad you're here. Until next time, be well. Hi, welcome back to Therapy Chat. 
I'm your host, Laura Reagan, and today I'm so happy to be talking with Lauren Going, LCSWC, who I know in real life. Lauren, thank you so much for being my guest on Therapy Chat today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy and excited that you're here too. And I'm really excited for our audience to hear what you're doing. I've known you, I'm going to say maybe almost like seven, eight years, sort of not, not very well, but in the world of trauma therapy and people who use like yoga therapy and more bottom up methods for healing. And then more recently with the new direction that you're going with your practice, I'm really excited for people to hear about what you're doing. So before we get into it, though, let's just start off by you telling our audience a little bit more about who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah. I So I am an LCSWC. As you said, I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland. I've been a social worker in practice for about 15 years years, I began, my roots are working in domestic violence, foster care, adults as being used as children. So I got super interested in what methods were effective for trauma. And, you know, as Bessel Vandercoach says, it's, it's a lot of the things that are weird <laughs> that aren't the standard talk therapy. So I, you know, studied EMDR, internal family systems, a lot of somatic techniques. I was originally a yoga instructor before I was a therapist. So that's where my practice has has gone. And just, yeah, just in the last year, I opened Inner Path Wellness with my co-founder, Eleanor Bramwell, because we really passionately believe in psychedelic assisted therapies and the healing effects of non-ordinary states of consciousness. And Baltimore didn't have any place doing this work yet. There's plenty on the West Coast and Colorado and lots of other places in the country. But this area has been one of the slowest to kind of pick up these treatments. So that's what we're doing now. And that's, yeah, that's where most of my attention is going these days. Yeah, that's, it's really exciting. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you about this is because I kind of said this before we started recording, but when trauma has become such a buzzword that people who are seeking a trauma therapist don't necessarily know how to discern what is trauma therapy and what is a therapist who's trauma informed or trauma sensitive or trauma conscious, conscient, conscious. Yeah. (laughs) But in the same way with psychedelics, people are hearing about it and people are hearing about you know, quote, moms microdosing every morning and entrepreneurs and CEOs microdosing and people are having experiences that are not in the mainstream, like underground. And there are people who are doing clinical trials. And then there are people who are doing it on their own without anybody helping them. And then there are some companies too, that are kind of popping up and they're like, here's how you can do psychedelic therapy. And it's, you know, again, it's hard for the the person who's seeking to have this kind of healing experience to really know what's what, how to, how to find what they have in mind. It's like the potential is great, but the, the way of engaging in that work is kind of mysterious. And Knowing you and knowing that you have an actual brick and mortar practice here and that you're a seriously skilled trauma therapist with a lot of experience who is now implementing psychedelic assisted therapy in your practice. And and that's what your whole practice is focused on. That's to me the kind of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy that I'm hoping for trauma survivors to find. And that's why I wanted to talk to you because I know that you're rooted in that background. Yeah, hundred, a hundred percent. And everything you're saying makes so much sense to me. It, it just makes, especially when you say people are confused. It's, it's just like, of course they are confused. And I feel like a big reason for that is, you know, this, this new resurgence of the research started around 2000 
here in Baltimore at Hopkins, which is super amazing. And so talk about worlds colliding. It's like traditional medical research world and indigenous practices and medicines and natural plant medicines. And yeah, yes, it's, it's wild. It's wild and completely. And so in the last 23 years, the amount of research that has been compiled and, you know, the, the outcomes are, are quite extraordinary. And then you have, you know, these, these big bestsellers like Michael Pollan's How to Change Your Mind and the Netflix series that came as a result of that. So this is really out there, you know, as far as, you know, kind of most people at some level are hearing about these treatments, but it is very confusing. Many people grew up with DARE, or, you know, or these other drug programs that really, you know, put things like mushrooms and psilocybin and LSD and, you know, these other substances, MDMA, in the category of heroin. You know, it's it's like all these things blend in some people's minds. So a lot of the work a lot now, of fear. a lot of fear and a lot of stigma. And so it is very confusing. And we're also in a time where you know, ketamine is available for clinical use, but psilocybin and MDMA are not, but they're often talked about. So then it's so confusing, like, what can I access and what is legal? And, you know, and and then this person offers it, but it's illegal and below ground, although the research is showing how promising it is. So it's super confusing how to access these treatments in a safe way. Makes sense. Yeah. And I think, you know, just like anything, the corporatization of these practices almost like gets ahead of the, you know, it's like, I can see every time I go on Facebook, I can see ads that tell me, oh, just order ketamine, push this button, you know, you can do it at home and you don't even have, and I'm like, wow, that's accessible, right? That's quote accessible. But at the same time, that doesn't feel right or safe. It feels very disembodied to me and very risky. So I know that there are these companies that can send some of the medicines to your home and I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but let's just start off by talking about, will you t- give us like a little bit of an overview about what the the types of medicines are that can be used in psychedelic assisted therapy now in therapy, therapy, not just like that exist and are legal potentially? Sure. Sure. I'm happy to. And this landscape is changing all the time. So whenever someone's listening to this, if this is months or a year later, it might have already changed. But right now, ketamine is in clinical use in all states. It can be used for ketamine-assisted therapy. Ketamine is not a classic psychedelic, but it does have psychedelic effects and can bring one into a non-ordinary state of consciousness and and actually has a similar impact on the brain at psilocybin and MDMA have. So ketamine assisted therapy is available. I, I know in Baltimore, we we are one of the first to offer it. So it's not available everywhere, but it is it is in legal clinical use. Besides that, psilocybin has been approved in certain certain states like Washington and Colorado for clinical use. And they have very specific programs to allow that to unfold. Each state kind of has its own guidelines around that. So there's certain jurisdictions that are already working with psilocybin. But really kind of the the future lineup is that MDMA should be in clinical use as early as it's now thinking next year, 2024, and then psilocybin soon after that. So many practices like my my here my here is inner path were Kind of looking to lay the groundwork with ketamine and then to add these other substances in the future. Yeah, thank you for explaining that. And I've I've heard that ketamine is the most kind of universally accessible and accepted one to be available in therapy practices now. And I have a quick side question about that because in therapist groups, whenever this ketamine assisted therapy is mentioned, this question, or this question comes to my mind, because these people always say this one thing. Can you tell us anything about escatamine? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, is that the same? What is it? If you know? Yes, yes. I I can say a little bit about it. So escatamine is a type of ketamine that was actually patented 
I believe if I'm correct, it's by the Johnson and Johnson Corporation. So it is a patented form of ketamine. And so there's racemic ketamine and there's the S ketamine. And as far as their effects on the brain used in therapy, really, really the same. It's just the one, I mean, I, not to be cynical, but, but it's kind of patented to make money. You know, yeah. it's a pharmaceutical company. They couldn't patent the generic form of ketamine. And that's what we use here in micro. It's super cheap. Ge- generic ketamine is very, very cheap. S ketamine is only used in the nasal form. It's a nasal spray and it's only used by clinics that have approval to use it. That it's pretty stringent and it can only be used for treatment resistant depression. Whereas the generic ketamine can be used off label for all kinds of mental health conditions. So there's a lot more flexibility with it. Well, thank you. And that brings another question to mind that I hope it's okay to ask. Yeah. If it's not yeah. fitting, feel free to say so. But is when they talk about treatment resistant depression, I say, oh, you mean trauma? But I'm wondering, you know, do you do you think treatment resistant depression is actually like, I mean, that's not a diagnosis that's in the DSM or anything. Right, 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 right. What is that? Well, yeah, yeah, no, it's a good, it's a good question. Well, since I, you know, since I've started working with ketamine, I, you know, it's, it's been a big term that's thrown around because that's what ketamine is super helpful with. And um, the definition of it is not in the DSM, but the definition of it is that you've tried two forms of treatment and they've not been effective. So you could have tried one what therapy and a medication or two medications and they really have had no impact on your depression to actually lessen it or take it away. And so, you know, two or more, many people tried, you know, I feel like two was very small for me. Yeah, really. I yes. mean, I wouldn't, when I think of treatment resistant, I think it's like some special kind of depression that can't be touched by other. And I think that's how it sounds. You know, if that's yeah. what I think, I'm sure that's what other people sure. think. But, 100%. but it's really the the effects, I guess, ketamine has been shown to be effective with depression for sure. But is it trauma yeah. symptoms, PTSD symptoms too, or? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a really interesting question. So the thing it's really known for and where it got its start in treatment of mental health was with a treatment resistant depression or hard to treat depressions. And actually suicidality. Ketamine is actually really profound when there's, you know, active suicidal ideation and that level of depression, which not many things are that helpful for at that time. Yeah. So it's it's really powerful. Some of my colleagues in the field are like, ketamine, you know, really should be considered in, you know, these these psychiatric emergency rooms yeah. as treatment just for that. So that's that's a whole other other thing. And so we, we know it, it's super helpful at the time for our to treat depression, suicidality. As far as trauma, yeah, it's really, really interesting. That is not as much of what it's been, you know, known for. However, there are, you know, studies coming out. It's, it's being shown to be really effective. There was a small study recently that was part of a compassion fatigue healthcare workers group that all, I think, in the group, all of them met the criteria for PTSD to be part of this group. And after, I think it was an eight week program. And after three ketamine assisted sessions, 80%, it was something around 80% no longer met the criteria for PTSD on, on the CAPS screening. And so, That's like yeah, huge. so it's huge. I mean, it was a small, a small sample, but very, very encouraging. And. And I can speak, you know, a little bit to what I've seen with ketamine. And, you know, for me, I actually got really interested in ketamine assisted therapy because I had been trained in psilocybin assisted and then DMA assisted and was, you know, restless. I'm like, I'm ready to use these treatments. I'm not right. willing to be an underground therapist. And I, I, w- I want to do this work. And so I got drawn to ketamine because it was available. And it's really interesting what's happened because I actually really love working with ketamine and I don't think I'm going to stop when those other treatments are available. And and a big reason is some of the unique mechanisms of ketamine. And one of them is actually its dissociative me- mechanism, which would seem counter 
Mm -hmm. productive with trauma. However, what I've seen for folks is that in the ketamine session is it actually leads to this, this bit of a dissociation from the body so that when the person is kind of re-entry, re-entering in, it's almost like they have the somatic awareness and experience that they didn't have before. And I think of it as if you went to the moon and looked at earth and it's like you had never seen earth from that perspective and then re-enter and have this different relationship with it. It's like there's a different relationship with the body for people that are living from the neck up. And it's really quite profound. There's also the down regulation of the amygdala and the default mode network. So there's less of the fear response to process traumatic material during the session. So there's, there's a lot going on and that could be really beneficial for trauma. Yeah, that's fascinating. And what you said about how I, I would never have considered myself when I have thought about doing psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, I would have thought basically psilocybin. But now with what I've been learning about ketamine, I'm like, it sounds like very usable, like the the different forms that it can come in and the different lengths of time that you can spend in the experience. You know, it seems very flexible in in some way (laughs) that I like. I like that. It's like, you know, that that makes it more functional, like more practical to be able to use it than I would have thought because I kind of pictured, you know, everything I've heard before was like eight hour long sessions. Yes. And, you know, that just seems automatically prohibitive to people because who has, you know, eight hours every week or, you know, not to mention that the cost prohibition and how many clients could each clinician have if they're doing eight hour long sessions, you know, regularly, I mean, you wouldn't be able to serve that many people because you'd be spending all your time. 100%. Yeah. And that's, that's, again, what is also really, you know, endeared me to ketamine, because, you know, we do two hour sessions, it's just a double session for folks. So the affordability that can allow is huge. It's also, you know, myself as a therapist to be present for two hours. It's very right. doable. Exactly. Instead um, of eight. To an eight hour. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so yeah, that's, it's huge. And then with ketamine, the other thing I would say too, is there really is a down regulation of the nervous system. That's just part of the mechanism, which is different from things like psilocybin, the substances like psilocybin that can have that effect, but it can also, for some people, it can bring up anxiety, which can be helpful to work through. But what I find people are most surprised with, with ketamine is they have, you know, just going into a new experience, there's naturally some, a uh, little bit of anxiety going in and, and, you know, just a little bit of something there. And people are usually pretty amazed at how relaxed they are because of that unique mechanism of ketamine. It actually relaxes them into the into the space where they might have had anxious or kind of overwhelming experiences with other psychedelics. Yeah, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to start asking you some different questions. But one thing sure. I'm thinking about is just how for people who are wanting to get the benefit of psycho- psychedelic assisted therapy, there can be it's such an unknown, like you don't know what you're going to open up. And that can be in itself terrifying and prevent people from actually, especially when you have a trauma history, you know, it's like, you know, the story of trauma is there's something there that I just can't, I can't know. I can't touch, you know, it's, it's too awful. I can't, I won't survive if I quote, go there, you know, it's like a door I don't want to open. And then it, it can be a similar experience to consider psychedelics because you do open up a non-ordinary experience. And so I like what you're saying about the, I don't, I don't remember the word you used, but it was something about that, you know, it sort of softens the, that you feel more relaxed so that you can, you can just allow that process and allow that curiosity to explore what might be in that door instead of being too afraid to open it. Yes. And and the one thing I'd say with that is, you know, I imagine there are some listeners that maybe 
are thinking of a story connected to ketamine where that wasn't the case. But this is really where we go into set and setting. <laughs> you know, I, one of my teachers in ketamine assisted therapy, you know, says that, you know, when referring to, you know, a deep ketamine state, which sometimes in recreational use is called a K hole, a K hole is super useful therapeutically, not so useful when you're at a concert in the porta potty. <laughs> that could be completely overwhelming, you know? And so a lot of people connect these substances to overwhelming, you know, even re-traumatizing experiences. And that's where, you know, the mindset, the, the actual setting who you're with is so important. And, and that's why, you know, to, for me, any really talented psychedelic assisted therapists are, you know, that is so much of what they're taking in consideration of when they're bringing someone into an open space like that. So that relaxation and that safety can really be a perceived and felt to go to go into those open places that it takes you. I'm I'm glad you mentioned that. And of course, no conversation about psychedelics would be complete without someone saying set and setting. But I always think it's like that's a that's almost buzzwords too. They have a really important meaning, but people don't really, people just repeat set and setting, set and setting. It's like, what does that mean? So will you explain that a little bit? Sure. Just a little bit no. more. I know you did yeah. just touch on it. No, no, I'm happy to unpack it for sure. No, I know. And I, and I get that, that they are, they are part and parcel of the psychedelic assisted <laughs> world. So yeah. So set really refers to the, the, the journeyer's mindset. And so, you know, what they're bringing in as far as, you know, have they had a fight that morning? You know, are they stressed out? You know, are, what are their worries? What, what is the quality of their mindset coming in? What is their intention? Why are they, why are they doing this? You know, and it's kind of like, I think for many people, it's hard to connect to why those are so important because it's kind of like, just kind of weave into my life and I forget about. But when you're in these open, expansive states, it's everything, you know, what you're bringing in. And so really having that ability to have an intention, to have a clear, you know, direction of, of why are you doing this? What is the mindset you're showing up with? It's so, so profound because that's the area that you're really exploring that's opening. And so how you're coming into it is really big. And that's my, that's set as uh, it's often referred to setting is everything external. So the, the set is kind of the internal. And then the setting is everything that's external from the physical environment. And that can include noise that one is around. They can include lighting, of course, the music, and then any presence, you know, people that are, are there with you, that the quality of the people surrounding you and whether you feel safe with them, that all impacts the setting. And so the, that's why it's just broken down, I think, into that little short phrase of set and setting, because it's all that's, you know, included in there. And it's so powerful and, and, and so important, the first factors that direct your journey. Try Therapy Notes, the number one rated electronic health record system available today. With live telephone support seven days a week, it's clear why Therapy Notes is rated 4.9 out of 5 stars on Trustpilot and has a 5-star rating on Google. Therapy Notes makes billing, scheduling, note-taking, and telehealth incredibly easy. And now for all you prescribers out there, Therapy Notes is proudly introducing ePrescribe. Try it today with no strings attached and see why everyone is switching to Therapy Notes, now featuring ePrescribe. You can get two months free by using promo code CHAT at therapynotes.com. Trauma Therapist Network is a website to learn about trauma and how it shows up in our lives and to find a trauma therapist. Go to traumatherapistnetwork.com to find a trauma therapist near you today. Well, thank you. I Once I asked you that question, I was like, well, didn't she just answer that? Maybe I shouldn't have asked. And then what you just said actually made me understand what it really means much more. And so it makes me wonder, how would someone know if it's right for them to do psychedelic assisted therapy? Like if not, if it's right for them, but if they, if they are in the right set and setting, <laughs> how would people be able to determine that? Do you have any 
thoughts about what what people could consider as they're trying to make those decisions? Because I feel like people just sort of stumble into it, either their friend is going to do it and they go, oh, yeah, sure, I'll come along. Or, you know, they they see an ad on Facebook and they're like, oh, I've been hearing this. Or they read the book and they're just like, where can I do this? And it's not always a very grounded decision when people do that. I think some people, it, you know, I'm not criticizing anybody who wants to make this decision, but I think sometimes we're like, oh, this is the answer. I'm going to do it, you know, and not sure what our real true intention is, even if some part of us is driving us towards that healing. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, you know, I, I obviously believe so much in the healing potential this work and these medicines. And I don't believe that psychedelics are right for everyone and definitely not right at every time for everyone. So I think that's a really important question, you know, to consider. Yeah, I I would say, you know, one consideration is really to me basic, basic not to have an experience alone and to, and to specifically to have that experience ideally with someone that is also not in the effects, which usually happens. If, if someone's having experience, they're usually with someone who's also in the shared effects. But to have someone that actually can be a grounding presence that is trusted, that one feels safe with, that can attend to anything that comes up for that person. At minimal, there are hotlines like the Fireside Project to at least know that our psychedelic support hotlines to be able to call if there was anything that came up, you know, being somewhere, ideally not in public. A lot of times these these substances, people think to have these experiences in public and then all of a sudden you're open and you're feeling everyone's energy and then people are talking to you. You don't even have cognitive, uh, your cognitive faculties are offline. It's, It's convenient. It can be very overwhelming. So being in a safe environment, you know, having supportive presences. Of course, as a psychedelic assisted therapist, I'm going to recommend number one to be with a psychedelic assisted therapist to really, you know, if you're going into, sometimes it's called a heroic journey, which is a full dose experience where you are going to lose connection with normal waking, you know, reality. To really have someone that that knows how to hold that space is really, really essential. So. That's, that's what I would say. And then I would say with that, you know, someone who is a trained psychedelic assist therapist knows kind of how to screen, you know, maybe this is not right for you. And I think a big thing for screening is stability, you know, is, is one's life stable? Is, is there, you know, maybe there's some things someone wants to have, work on, but they have good support in their life. They have a lot of stability in their life. They've already done you know, some exploratory work, you know, they, they, so they're ready to kind of go to these places. Like they kind of know what they want to work with, not just like, I feel terrible. This, this is going to make me feel great. Right. You know? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Having some level of self-awareness going in, having some level of, you know, I would say even like a mindfulness practice or ability to have that ability to recognize what is coming up that is not necessarily the totality of one's experience. These are kind of, to me, like basic preliminary things. And, and you know, a psychedelic assistive therapist can work with people on those. And it might take some sessions to actually get to the dosing session and make sure it's a really safe, you know, healthy experience for that person. Okay, so that, thank you. That's very helpful. And I guess my next question is, needs to be, how would people know if the person that they want to work with is a, an appropriate psychedelic assisted therapist for them? Is there any thing, you know, it's so new and it's changing so fast. And, you know, myself, I've done some research on this and attended some smaller trainings, no training in actually doing psychedelic assisted therapy. So it's like, I know a little bit about it and I know I'm a skilled therapist, but I'm not a psychedelic assisted therapist because I don't have that training. So I would consider that to be totally outside of my scope. But I think that sometimes people are a little looser with what they think is within their scope, especially if they don't understand the depth of levels of training that 
that are out there. Can you speak a little to that? So for people who both therapists who are listening, who want to maybe think about implementing this and also people who would be seeking therapy and wanting to be sure that they're with the provider that's going to be appropriate and safe for their situation? Sure. That's a really great question. And it is, again, coming back to confusion at this time. You know, there, there is a lot of confusion. And a big part of that is, you know, it really is the wild, wild west in this, in this psychedelic assisted field right now, because it is here and it is really exploding. And there is no certification board or oversight board. So you have all these training centers that have sprouted up. Many, honestly, you know, I mean, many have really good intentions, but some, you know, are money makers, you know, and and just kind of pop up to capitalize on what's happening. And so it does get tricky. Someone might be trained in, you know, something, but it might be like a weekend training and that's pretty minimal to do this work. They're, you know, they're, I would say looking into like doing your research to see what are reputable trainings. And generally those are a minimal a few months and really in depth. And so that would be number one, has this person done an in-depth training, you know, for MDMA, there's really only maps. And so I, they're, you know, as MDMA, have they done the maps training? There's places like Naropa has a really wonderful program, CIIS. These have like year long training programs and multiple substances and really in-depth work or has that person the multiple, you know, reputable trainings that they can really, you know, string together. Do they have experience? Have they been, you know, have they been assisting people for some time, which is tricky since it's so new that that that, that is a factor. I believe, and this is not across the board, this is a personal belief uh, that I know shared by others, is does the person have their own personal experience with psychedelics. I actually personally believe that it's very essential that the person taking you and guiding and supporting you in these states knows a bit of the territory. I think it'd be very hard to do this work effectively without that. So I think that's a really great question to, you know, to find out, you know, do they have their, their own experience? So those are, you know, two, two of the big ones. And I would say the third one to me is, you know, do I feel comfortable or safe with this person and not just that they have the right degree or they went to the right program. I feel like equally important is when I'm in their presence, how do I feel? Can I actually feel that sense of my nervous system relaxing and trust there? I think that one is huge for this work. That makes sense. And actually with what you just said about set and setting too, if you if you are like, oh, this person's close to my house, they seem fine, you know, and oh, they say they're trained. That's good enough for me. They're a real therapist and not just the Facebook ad that was going to send me this stuff to my house and I wasn't going to have anybody. That might be better than nothing. But on the other hand, if you can't sense a sense of at least this feels right to me, like a sense of that, not just like, yeah, fine, good enough, but like, I like how I feel when I'm with this person. Then I assume that when, based on my own psychedelic experiences before I was ever a therapist long time ago, 30 years ago, I would assume that that lack of safety sense will present itself in the experience. And so that's the, that's like the trick. It's like, if you don't, (laughs) if you don't tune into what you sense, then whatever you were sensing that you weren't tuned into will be, maybe it will be that the person was really safe and you just couldn't access your felt sense. Or it could be that internally you have a felt sense of not being safe. And then that causes maybe a reaction during the experience. I'm talking out of my own lived experience only in the past and not even knowing, I didn't even know anything about therapy then. So take it with a grain of salt, what I just said. (laughs) And tell me if I'm wrong. (laughs) No, no, it makes sense. And it makes me think of kind of adding to, you know, I don't think an essential requirement, but does that, does that person as well have some training in, you know, kind of not just straight kind of cerebral talk therapy? Do they also have training in somatic, you know, work or internal family systems? These kind of therapies that can help to work with, you know, what, what is actually coming up at from those bottom up 
levels, which is a lot of what's going to happen in the psychedelic space. Thank you. I agree. And, and that, that really helps just to sort of create a little bit of a, an outline of things to think about. Do you think we have enough time for you to tell us what, say, one of your two-hour sessions or what the process in general, including the two-hour sessions, would sort of look like if, if people came to InnerPath? Sure. Yeah, for sure. So the first step, you know, we have kind of a pretty clear flow of treatment. And so the first step is to do an intake. And that's, well, actually, the first step is to do a screening, you know, to, to make sure you're a good fit for the treatment medically and psychologically. There's certain things to kind of rule out and be clear about. And then if you are to do an intake, get really clear about your the person's goals and intentions. What do they hope to get out of this? Get a sense of who they are. What, what are they showing up with? Start developing rapport. And then and then there are prep sessions, preparation sessions after that. And a minimal, there's one, but there might be multiple if there really needs to be time for rapport to be built, skills to be built, you know, like we talked about the mindfulness and, and, and skills you want to take into the psychedelic session. And then we call it the dosing session is the actual ketamine session. And that's the two hour, you know, session at that point. And, and I would say it's really interesting. It can really be designed in different ways. You know, for some people, they want to have more of a higher dose psychedelic experience it's very internal they have eye shades on they have their music they're in a process their default mode network is really kind of quieted down so they're not really verbal you know so that's a lot of the session and then you know maybe for the last 45 minutes there's integration and kind of processing um, and then the other is some people might do a lower dose which we call a psycholytic dose which really just softens the defenses and IFS, you know, we think about it as the protectors kind of soften down a bit so we can really, you know, access self-energy and and work with parts in this really clear and blended way. It's really helpful in that way. And so then it's very dynamic and we are kind of unfolding and talking and doing more of a therapeutic process during the entire session. And so there's different ways that can go depending on the goals of the person. And then after that session, we always have an integration, which is where we explore, like, how do we take what came up in the session and now bring it into your life to really create lasting change, which to me is the most important part, because I think that's where there can be criticisms, especially ketamine. It's like the results are amazing, but then they go down. But that's typically connected to infusion centers where there is no integration. And that's really where the rubber hits the road is like, okay, you know, I realize I'm isolated and I don't really have many people in my life. So then let's look at how do we get you connected during this neuroplastic window that ketamine is really opened where changes are a lot more possible. There's a lot more kind of new ways of seeing, of being, of relating. So how do we maximize that window right now? And then we kind of take it from there. There might be a few integration sessions then followed by sometimes people want to do a series of ketamine sessions. There might be three dosing with integration between. And then I find people often will come back for a booster some months later when they have something specific to work on. So it kind of unfolds like that. Okay. So thank you. That's, that's helpful. And I'm curious about the psycholytic dose. I'm curious because I have the impression that the higher the dose, the longer it lasts. There's also the idea, I could be wrong about this. So these are just my thoughts. And then the idea that you could take a dose and then take another dose, like say 45 minutes later to extend it, or, you know, it seems to be kind of pretty fast acting. And then there's also different ways people can ingest it or receive it, infusion versus oral. And even we talked about esketamine. So when you say psycholytic, the lower dose, is that shorter lasting or is it something about the concentration? Now I'll be quiet and you can answer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, no, no worries. Yeah. It's not necessarily, it's not necessarily shorter acting. You know, we, we offer both oral lozenge and we offer IM intramuscular injection, very different routes, very different experiences, pros and cons to both, you know, to consider. And generally when people want more of a psycholytic dose, 
lozenges can be really great for that because there's actually less absorbed with that, that route. And so, you know, once the, the medicine, there's effects there, there really is kind of the same way, even, even at smaller doses that okay. come. And, and like you were saying, there can be kind of a booster dose given. And so since we do two hour sessions, we tend to offer those within about 10 or 15 minutes, because if we offer them too much later, it would extend the session much, much longer. But that is a way to extend the effects of the session. And what's nice about the booster and breaking up, breaking up the dosage is it allows someone to ease into the medicine space without kind of being more overwhelmed by a, a large, strong, intense experience. They can yeah. kind of often have half and then maybe even half, you know, 10 minutes later, very different easing in. That's interesting and helpful to know. And I have, I don't want to, I have more questions. I don't want to run out of time, but there's three thoughts. The cyclitic dose, and it's going to be a two hour session. So it's not the eye shades. Is that like a regular therapy session where you are interacting the way you normally would during therapy, but the person is having this different state of consciousness during the session? Or is it still, you know, the way that I've heard about it again, the most is the laying on a bed, eye shades, eight hours, two clinicians, but that's doesn't sound like the way you're talking about it at all. Well, you know, it could be done in that way without eye shades and someone, you know, sitting up, but generally with ketamine there, one of the side effects that can come is nausea. And so it actually is really helpful to lay down Mm -hmm. and withdraw the senses. And I find it helpful just to connect to the inner world. So even though we're still talking, often the person is still laying down and often does have eye sheets on, Okay, you know, in some fashion. So, yep, that that is that is still what it looks like. Okay. And is it one therapist or more than one? Traditionally with ketamine, I know like MDMA in particular, a lot of the psilocybin models, especially because of the length, they their model is two two therapists. So one can go to the bathroom or, you know, kind of take a little bit of a break at times from those long sessions. I mean, generally it's always one therapist. We only have one therapist. I'm just one-on-one. Okay. Thanks for asking these little details. But I mean, if I were listening to this, I would be like, how does that work? And I would want to know. And then I get stuck sometimes in like those, those questions and can't track the rest of what's going on. So the next question is, when you say do deliver it intramuscularly, I know you're not an MD or anything. Is there, what's the medical aspect of that? How does that part fit in? Good question. So one thing I left out with the flow of the treatment is there's always a medical evaluation. Someone has to prescribe the ketamine. So that is the medical doctor, the nurse practitioner, you know, whoever that is right now, we work with an MD that comes here. And so it's prescribed that way. And um, lozenges, the client self-administers, so they get a prescription in the mail and they bring them to our office and they self-administer. So myself, with my licensure, I don't administer any medicine. They self-administer. With the IM, the doctor is there for that part. And so they're yeah. not there the whole session, but they come and administer the IM injection, check to see if they need a booster, check that everything is medically going well, and then they they at some point at the beginning leave, usually after about 15 minutes. Okay. So that yep. would change the dynamic a little bit. And also I'm sure the cost, if the MD has to be there and yes. be present, that's going to make a difference in that. Yes, exactly. It's a little bit more for the IN sessions. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then the last thing I wanted to ask, I hope we have enough time, is you you mentioned infusion centers before, and we didn't really touch on that. I did want to talk about that. I just kept asking other questions. But when I first heard about ketamine being made legal, I was like, no way. I'm not doing that. I'm not going to deliver that to people. They have these infusion centers and they just leave people by themselves for these hours and hours of, of ketamine infusion. And, you know, they, they have no one with them. And I believe that from what I've heard from people that it can bring up all kinds of memories of being alone, you know, traumatic memories of, you know, that kind of abandonment, isolation. And obviously what you're doing is completely different, but can you say a little bit about, you know, those differences of what those 
infusion center experiences or setups are like for how they're different from this, from really ketamine assisted psychotherapy? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a good question. It's important to, to acknowledge because they're very, very different. You know, the infusion clinics, even down to kind of the thought behind them is it's almost like you're getting an infusion for your brain, you know? So if there's no interest in what the, the therapy does or, you know, adding therapy. It's kind of like you're getting like a vitamin infusion. It's like, this will boost, you know, your, you know, serotonin levels and this will activate this kind of glutamate surge that will make your brain neuroplastic and some good things will happen. And that's true. Good things could potentially happen, but you're right. When we talk about set and setting, that's what can be really disturbing at these some of these infusion centers. And I don't want to say all of them because I, I'm sure there's some with really lovely care. But I know many that, you know, leave the fluorescent lights on. They leave a TV on during you know, the ketamine experience. So a very different model. And, and really the mechanism of action is really thought of as just this kind of kind of neurochemical treatment. And so with ketamine assisted therapy, the difference is that it's the therapy that's assisted by the ketamine. It is about the relationship and it's assist and the ketamine allows someone to feel, to open, to actually lower their defenses in a way that might really allow the therapy to unfold. So it's like my, it's like apples and oranges, you know, how they they go down. And and I be, I, you know, obviously a huge believer in assisted therapy. I think infusions can be helpful if someone's doing prep and integration, maybe on either side, and you have a center. That's very caring. I think there's possibilities there, but yes, it's very different. I just thought about like, it sounds like it's almost a difference between in terms of how infusion centers can be different. One could be like a spa setting where you're treated with a lot of pampering and softness and it's very attuned, even if you are by yourself, but you're kind of being held in certain ways around the experience. And then the other is like a, you know, a stark clinic where, you know, you could be there for chemo and IV and antibiotics, a B12 infusion or, you know, <laughs> or ketamine. And it's just sort of like, just we're a place where you can be hooked up to that machine and that medicine can be delivered to you and then you leave, you know, whatever. Exactly. hundred yeah. percent. So there's the setting part again. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there it is again. <laughs> well, Lauren, I am so grateful to you for taking the time to come and talk with me and answer these questions so openly and just let me really explore all of my ideas and get my questions answered. Because I know that people who are listening have many of the same questions and will be very appreciative of everything you shared. Sure. Of course. No, this was a lot of fun being here. I was so happy to share. Yeah. Well, tell us where people can find your practice. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So our, we are known as Inner Path Wellness and we are based in Baltimore. So all our ketamine work is here. Although we have a lot of virtual offerings, we also do microdose coaching, you know, and that that's available you know, no matter what your location. I'm so dying you to ask you about that. I just have to do it another time. <laughs> that might be a part two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're located online at innerpathbaltimore.com is our website. I'm on social media as, psych as psychedelic healing therapy it can be found there. So yeah, please, please reach out. I'm happy to talk or answer any questions or connect. Thank you so much, Lauren. I, I know Baltimore is very lucky to have you and Inner Path Wellness and you and Eleanor and Inner Path Wellness serving. And every time I see a new post about something else you're doing, I'm like, this is amazing. A place is wonderful. I went to your open house. It's a beautiful space and just a lot of really embodied, grounded healers there. And, you know, it's, it's felt in the space. So when you talk about setting, I, I can tell you. Even in a busy open house where it was a humid time, we I, I felt how, how good it would be to be there. So I'm really grateful that you're doing this for the community and and the way that you're leading in, in our area to share all of this with everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, that really warms my heart hearing you say that. <laughs> all right. I just want to say one more time, thank you so much for being my guest today.
therapists, we've all had that moment. You wake up in the middle of the night. Oh my gosh, did I do my notes? Well, you don't have to worry about that anymore when you use therapy notes. Therapy notes makes it easy to write your notes, get them done quickly, but thoroughly. My group practice has used therapy notes for six years and everyone always finds it easy to use. But the best thing is if you do need help, you can call their customer service number and a person answers the phone. And anytime I've ever had to use it, which is maybe three times in the past six years, my issue has been resolved easily with a cheerful demeanor in 15 minutes or less. So I highly recommend Therapy Notes. And don't forget, go to therapynotes.com and use promo code chat to get two free months. The Institute for Creative Mindfulness is the EMDR therapy training brainchild of Dr. Jamie Marich, a clinician and author and previous guest of Therapy Chat, who's on a mission to confront stigma around mental health, trauma, and dissociation. The Institute, informed by Jamie's work, teaches a somatic, expressive, bottom-up approach to EMDR therapy that does not treat dissociation like a dirty word. The Institute for Creative Mindfulness empowers its students to navigate dissociation as a normal response to trauma and stress when it shows up. Dr. Jamie Marich, who is out and proud on various levels about her own recovery, is a strong believer in the healing capacities of EMDR therapy and helping our clients to heal from the impact of trauma. She and her hand-selected team of faculty members will work with you to apply this modality in a practical and integrative way. In a special offer available to listeners of Therapy Chat Podcasts, you can use the code THERAPYCHAT to receive 15% off of any program offered by the Institute for Creative Mindfulness in 2023. This includes their EMDR therapy basic training programs and a wide variety of home study, advanced topics, and other CE offerings. Go to instituteforcreativemindfulness.com and use the code THERAPYCHAT, all caps, that's THERAPYCHAT, at instituteforcreativemindfulness.com to save 15% off of any program in 2023. Thank you for listening to Therapy Chat with your host, Laura Reagan, LCSWC. For more information, please visit therapychatpodcast.com.